Our epistle lesson for this morning comes to us from the 13th chapter of the book of Hebrews, the letter to the Hebrews, verses 1 through 8 and 15 through 16. Listen to God's word. Let mutual love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing that, some have entertained angels without even knowing it. Remember those who are in prison as though you were in prison with them, those who are being tortured as though you yourselves were being tortured. Let marriage be held in honor by all, and let the marriage bed be kept undefiled, for God will judge fornicators and adulterers. Keep your lives free from the love of money. Be content with what you have. For God has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can say with confidence, God is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can anyone do to me? Remember your leaders, those who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. For Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so through Christ, then let us continually offer a sacrifice of praise to God. That is, the fruit of lips that confess his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. This is the word of our God. Thanks be to God. So I always loved it when my friend Jennifer and I would meet outside after dinner to play and we found out that both of our families, without even coordinating anything, had eaten spaghetti for dinner. <laughs> All right, now I'll tell you, this, this coincidence felt more like an affirmation of something we knew to be true. We were related. <laughs> All right, our 10-year-old logic went like this, and I stand by it today. All right, if we really were God's children, like our parents had told us, it didn't matter that we grew up three houses away and that we had different last names. We were sisters. And every now and again, God would let us know that we were right. That God believed this too by inspiring our moms to make the same dinner as it, on the same night as if we were sitting at one big family dinner table, a foretaste of what was to come. All right, now it is easy to spot what connects us when we want to be connected, right? A shared perspective, we nod our heads. Belting the lyrics to a favorite song, our voices never sounded so good. Or eating the same dinner on the same night as our best friend. The details that then make up our own story suddenly becomes part of a larger narrative when we can find that common thread. And then those connections shape our identity. They shape our understanding of our situation in the world. They form our world view, our hopes, our concerns, our sense of belonging, and our willingness to give. Now, I don't know about you, but spaghetti or not on the same night, it's been a bit harder lately to experience connection in the ways I have for years. Connection has felt different lately, even a little unfamiliar. Sometimes it has felt hard. 
even as we try to return to some semblance of normal, air quotes, or the way things were, or the way things should be, it's hard to escape the fact that things are different. Now, I guess that some of it has to do with the circumstances of our world over the last few years. Our shared experience of the COVID pandemic that once brought neighbors together to applaud frontline workers or decorate sidewalks with sidewalk chalk or sew masks for strangers and hand them out on the street, soon turned into language that divided us into bubbles or pods or even camps. And we've heard it before that our national political structure birthed in a rhetoric of unity and representation has grown increasingly polarized. And we have wisened up and grown more aware than ever that we have never really been as united as we have said we were. So then what do we do? Well, sometimes we unfriend or block friends on social media who disagree with our stance on vaccinations or student loan debt relief. We try to decide where it's okay for us to take our kids trick-or-treating, and we chart a path based on flags and yard signs that align with our take on the world. We try to make the best of things and find a way forward because any way we slice it, it sometimes feels like there is more to disagree about or at least less disagreement that we can politely ignore. It's interesting to think about how this lectionary that I just read a few moments ago might have been heard differently three years ago when year C came around last. A lot has happened since it surfaced. That was the time, you know, before COVID, or the insurrection on the Capitol, that was back when Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg and George Floyd were both still alive. But see, we gather today now on this side of the lectionary, and these ancient words of this final chapter of a letter to the Hebrews calls us in our here and now to shift focus. Just like the words we heard from the prophet Jeremiah, or the parable that was read that Jesus taught to those around him, we too are invited to shift focus. And that rather than, than spending time in our situating ourselves within the context of worldly divides, this is my situation dance, like this is one divide and I'm in divide over here. The writer of this letter kind of snaps their fingers and says, hey, hey you, Focus. Come on, focus. All right, so focus on what? Now, at first glance, a quick read through this passage sounds like this letter is calling each individual one of us to focus on moral living. It sounds as if this letter is asking each individual then to start to create a life an individual life that brings glory to God through personal, ethical decisions and strong moral character. Now, while this is not entirely wrong, that's not the focus the, letter, the author of this letter is trying to call us to. See, we miss the mark if we see these exhortations merely as a call to a standard of personal piety. This narrow read builds more silos, tempts us to rank members of our church according to faithfulness, one better than the other. One could even argue that such a narrow read of these verses is actually counter to the underlying message of this letter and frankly, of the gospel itself. See. The letter to the Hebrews snaps us out of our impulse to see ourselves as individuals among individuals and invites us 
to focus on how our identity is established by our engagement in community. A community created, formed, and into which we were called by God's love. The author invites us to drop the illusion that God's claim on anyone's life sets them apart or over another, and the author points out that God's claim, in fact, disrupts the hierarchies that sort us out in the world and cause us to th see things and each other differently. Focus, church, the author writes. Focus on loving God. Focus on loving each other. Focus on loving those from whom you might be compelled to distance yourself. Focus on stretching yourselves to welcome more broadly than you have ever been comfortable. Focus on growing your ability to empathize with those who suffer as if you yourselves are suffering. Focus on letting go of any impulse to claim a camp or pick a favorite or assert your own righteousness. Focus instead on drawing together. Focus on caring for those who are vulnerable with tenderness and affection and a sense of duty that you would give to a member of your own household. Focus on love. And so we too hear these words as disciples of a risen Christ in our context. As we try to figure out how to be church navigating the tides of a pandemic that have pulled us apart but remains, where we have signs on our door that says mask, Mask optional. All right, we're in the red zone. We're in the yellow zone. We're in the green zone. And we ride those waves throughout our life. We hear these words within our context as we, as ELPC, tries to figure out how to be church in this present season of transition. Not just as we move on from Randy's pastorate, but also as we strive to be faithful and engaged in this liminal time before an interim pastor is even called. We hear these words as we try to be church in a manner that responds to the societal sins that wound us, that captivate us, while we also confront the difficult truth that in order to do so, we must face the impact and vestiges of these sins as they show up inside our own selves. And the words of this ancient letter remind us of our familial roots. We are gods. Whether we prefer to clap while we sing or sit in silence, whether we vote according to our conscience or our loyalty to a party, whether we cheer for the Steelers or anyone else, I couldn't even, I mean, why would anyone do that? But why would anyone cheer for the Steelers either? Let's be real right now. <laughs> whether we eat spaghetti for dinner or toss a filet on the grill, we are family. We are grafted into a complex and dynamic family tree with stories of deception and courage Stories of disappointment and loss, and stories of miraculous blessings. We are a part of a family who has at times embraced the blessing and challenges of our call, and we are part of a family who has run and run and run and run away from the will of God. We can't escape it even if we try. We are yoked with those who are imperfect, just like us. We are yoked with those who struggle to make ends meet and those who have way more than they will ever need. We are a part of each other, of those who need a lot of quiet or those who chew too loud. 
We are a part of a family of those who do complicated equations in their brains and those who want to run from any form of challenge. We are family. Like the early church, we too may struggle to live into this identity. We may need to then notice where anxiety is fueling our way forward, where our own agenda is bubbling up, or where we are holding too fast to our attachment to the past. We may need to fess up about the burdens and the limits we carry, or even how our messed up view has hurt our relationships, our view of ourselves or our ability to do our best. We may struggle to find a reason to hope when we see the suffering that exists in this world that even impacts people of faith. But the author of Hebrews and God's own self call us out of silos and fears and into community. God calls us to not just pull up a chair alongside another, but to this dynamic exchange of love and mercy and justice that goes in every direction. Love mutually, love freely, love even without needing to be loved back. Love those you have been trying to steer clear of. Love those who are convenient to ignore, those who are imprisoned those whose suffering makes you uncomfortable. But do more than express affection to those who are marginalized. Love them as if your own life depended on it, as if you were imprisoned or suffering or set aside yourself. Brian Stevenson calls it getting proximate, and I love this language. He says, whatever you do, like whatever you do, find ways to get proximate, especially to people who are suffering. For when you get proximate to the excluded and the disfavored, you learn things that you need to understand if you are going to change the world. Our understanding of how we change things comes in proximity to inequality, to injustice, to each other. It is by drawing near to one another, even those whose life circumstances trouble us or whose own experience of injustice calls us in, that we most clearly see ourselves and our world the change that is needed for any of us to find wholeness, and in fact, the call God has placed on us as a family. It is in community that we experience an identity that cannot be found on any photo, ID, or name tag, and express a love that is bigger than our own hearts can hold. It is in community that the drop of our own life becomes part of that ocean. Pope Francis said, quite a few years of life have strengthened my conviction that each and everyone's existence is deeply tied to that of others. Life is not merely time passing by. Life is about interactions. And solidarity is a free response born from the heart of each and everyone when one realizes that life, even if in the middle of so many contradictions, is a gift, that love is the source and meaning of life, how can they withhold the, their urge to do good to another fellow being? And so we hear this call today a call to notice ourselves, our silos, our pods, our camps, but also to notice our role as part of an entire human family brought to life 
through the grace of a shared divine parent and reconciled to God through the redemptive work of Christ who took on human flesh and, dw and dwelt among us. We are called to focus on the welfare not only of ourselves or even our households, but of the broadest expression of us so that together with God's help, we can be the best us we can be. An us that collaborates to end suffering. An us that responds to needs. An us that enacts justice. An us that dim dismantles injustice. An us through whom God's love is visible. It is not going to be easy. Not even as easy as the serendipitous occasion of sharing spaghetti on the same night as a best friend. But it is possible by God's grace. And so friends, may we love. May we love in a way that pulls us deeper into relationship with one another, with our truest selves and with God. May we love as if we are grateful. May we love like lives depend on it. May we love like we have been loved by God. May it be so.